Hi, the book I'm going to review today is called The Age of Louis XIV and it's written by Voltaire. I was going through some of my bookshelves and I found a small collection of books I bought when I was in England and France uh, many decades ago. One of the, the reason why they have in common is they're all Everyman Library books. Now today there's a current imprint of the Everyman Library which is pretty popular because of the, mainly because of the quality of the, the, the books that they're publishing. But there's a whole history of the Everyman books and the ones that I have, I think they're from the 30s and they're very small books like this. And I had never seen these in the United States used bookstores at the time when I was, this is in the late 1980s when I was in England. You know, I saw these in England and I was like, oh, these are so interesting. They're so cool. They're just a great size. You know, the, um, all the titles were interesting to me. And they, they have like, they have a very thin paper, but it's very durable. And they just have a really good feel to them. They have a real good essence to them. And it just kind of, to read one of these books, it, it, I just think of the per, a person who was reading in the last century, you know, in the 30s, 40s, 50s maybe. This is the kind of book that a, um, an English person would be reading. So I bought um, several in England. I bought uh, Foissart's Chronicles of England, which is this one. I bought Captain Singleton by Daniel Defoe. I bought Terratan of Tarascon by Alphonse Daudet. I bought Treatise on Human Nature by David Hume, Edward VI by James Anthony Frode, House of the Dead by Dostoevsky, Book of Nonsense by Edward Lear, and the one I'm going to review today, which is The Age of Louis the Fourteenth. The front piece on them is, is very nice. It kind of looks like this, and it's well done. And this, is, this edition is um, translated by Martin P. Pollock. I had bought about the seven of them in England, and then I had filling up my suitcase. So then I went to France, and I was finding all these other books. I found some bookstores there, and I went into the famous Shakespeare and Company bookstore. I had to buy a book from there. And one of the things that they do, they did at that time, and that they do at this time, is they stamp the inside of the books. So this one has the coveted stamp of the Shakespeare and Company bookstore. So that, to me, that adds a lot to it, and it's a, it's a great memory of that trip. So I'm going to assume that most people have heard of Voltaire, and the most common book that is uh, published by Voltaire is Candide. When you look at Voltaire's entire works, there's volume after volume of works by him, and it's, I'm kind of amazed that th there aren't very many that have been translated into English. Candide is the most popular, and to me, Candide is kind of like dessert. This book is more like a meal. Voltaire is very comprehensive in his history of the age of Louis XIV. Now, if you're new to French kings, you know, there's, it can kind of be intimidating when you first approach a subject like the monarchy in France. But there are two kings that you should really concentrate on at the beginning. One of them is Louis XIV, and he's known as the Sun King and Louis the 16th and he was the king during the French Revolution and he was beheaded in 1792 but today we're doing Louis the 14th he reigned from 1643 to 1715 sometimes people in reviews they reject earlier histories because they've been outdated, new facts have been known, and kind of other snobby reasons. I read this because I wonder because Voltaire is a very has a very good reputation as a prose writer, and I want to know what Voltaire is about. I want to know what he looks at in the world. You know, I could read a biography of Voltaire, but I'd rather read his original writings and make my own opinions about who was the man named Voltaire. Regarding the facts, I know my own mind and I don't, if I'm going to read a book with a bunch of facts, they're not going to really even stick in my head. I mean, I'll enjoy it while I'm reading the book, but you know, a bunch of facts and dates and towns, I'm not going to remember them. So I, 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 that's why for me, it's the writing and the story and the um, observations of the author that are important. So Voltaire opens the book and he kind of opens it like a theatrical performance. 
There are four great periods of advanced civilization where mankind was at its peak. The first is the age of Pericles, second is the age of Caesar and Augustus, the third is the age of the Medici and Florence and Venice, and then there is the age of Louis XIV. So he sets out his thesis and it's up to him to prove this throughout the volume. He, t he does kind of a snapshot of Europe during Louis XIII and he goes through the principal players in Europe. There's Spain, England, United Provinces, Turkey, Italy, Portugal, Germany, and the Roman Catholic Church. He makes an interesting comparison with the Roman Catholic Church and he, he says that it's it's kind of an extension of the Roman Empire because when you think about it, it the Roman Empire stretched out through all of Europe and the Roman Catholic Church did the same thing. He points out that the time of Louis XIII, they had poor roads, minimal trade, low quality arts, uh, no French Navy, the citizens were pretty ignorant, they all had like no skilled jobs and they had very rough manners. And the Roman Catholic Church had a lot of influence over the people. You know, so the, so the, so the government of France had to share their authority with the Roman Catholic Church. When Louis was first made king, he was under age, and so his mother, Anne of Austria, ruled the country until he became of age. Once Louis became of age, he began this series of wars, mainly on the east side of France. Voltaire spends like over 200 pages on all of these wars in Europe. Now, if you look at a map here of the territory that he won during his reign, the territory he won was in, is in orange. And it's really kind of meager, in my opinion, you know, what he was getting. It, to me, it seems kind of like he was just trying to intimidate people to um, display his power. Voltaire goes through all the battles, goes through all the um, sieges. They had battles on the fields, but then they had sieges where the army would go up to a town and the town would be kind of surrounded by stone walls and they would put a siege on the town and cut off its resources and attack the town and eventually overcome the town and take control of the town. And in a lot of these cases, they would seize a town or win a battle and then like months later or a year later they would lose everything that they gained. So it was just kind of ridiculous what they were doing. The two main generals are General Condé and General Touraine and I found a list of all the sieges and battles for General Touraine that he took place of. I'm going to run a scroll here that you can see it's just uh, one after another after another. So Voltaire goes through all these. He, you know, he goes all the dates, all the towns, and you know, I, I know a little bit about French geography, but I, I didn't spend too much time trying to remember this because I know, with my mind, it's just like no value for me to I, to memorize these. And I get the point. You know, Louis. It was a major part of his rule of France to engage in all these conflicts. Later on, Voltaire does admit that these were kind of a waste of time, though I think as a Frenchman he kind of enjoyed it because they were always winning. You know, it was, it's, it was kind of a big boost to their self-confidence of France that they were winning all these battles and they had, you know, such supremacy over the um, continent. Another thing about the conflicts is the leaders in all these countries were related to each other. So it, you would think that if the king of France was related to the king of Spain, there would be a reason for they for peace. But this wasn't so. They, they were still fighting each other. It just makes the whole thing really re more ridiculous. I try to imagine why they would have these battles because they were always trying to um, marry their daughters to someone, a foreign dignitary, and their sons to foreign women. They were always trying to join their monarchy to another one, but then they would have a war against the one they were trying to join. So I just, the only way I could wrap my head around that conflicting ideas was it's just vanity. They were just showing off 
pompous excuse for domination. So let's go through some of the relationships. Okay, Anne of Austria was Louis XIV's mother. Her brother was the King of Spain. But France was at war with Spain. Louis was against the Elector of Bavaria, whose sister he had married to his son. Louis was in arms against the Elector of Palatine, whose country he burnt after married his brother to the Palatine princess. Ja the King of England, James, the King of England's daughter, drove her father from the throne. The King of England was driven from his throne by his daughter and his son-in-law. And Voltaire does condemn this and says this was just a horrible thing to do. Okay, the Duke of Marlborough from England was one of the few generals who won significant battles against Louis XIV's army. One of the great things that Louis did was to build uh, the French Navy because the, the English and the, and the, the Netherlands, they were really ruling the seas, but uh, Louis made a significant advances in the French Navy to challenge their superiority. So after about 250 pages, Voltaire moves on to the anecdotes of Louis XIV. So this is the courtly life, little stories about things that happened to Louis. And I like this section. The, you know, there's intrigues and jealousies and maneuverings. Louis's first wife died in 1683, so Louis had many affairs and flirtations with women of the court. And there's one great story where Louis was flirting with this princess and he would send her poems, or they call them verses. So Louis met this Marquis de Danjou. The king employed him to write letters to this princess. Well, the princess also knew the Marquis de Danjou, and she employed him to write letters to the king. So, there were, so he was writing letters to both parties, and they didn't know about it. So the Marquis served both sides without letting the other know, and he was a great success on both sides. Voltaire compliments Louis XIV for having so many affairs and not letting all this, all of this emotional relationships interfere with his governing the state of France. Another story that I liked was about the Duke of Vivon. He was brother of the Marshal of France and he was one of the best read of the courtiers and he was endowed with great taste. So the King Louis XIV once said to the Duke of Vaughan, you know, what's the use of reading? And the Duke, who was a pudgy man, he said, reading does to the mind what your partridges do to my cheeks. Uh, and then we move on to Madame May Tenon. She was secretly married to King Louis, so she was a very ambitious woman, and she seduced the king, which was uh, quite an accomplishment. But she found herself bored, and Voltaire quotes some of her private letters, and she wrote to her friend, Oh, that I could tell you my problems. If I could reveal to you the boredom which assails the great, the difficulty they have in finding something to occupy their time. Do you not see how I'm dying of ennui in the midst of wealth, such as you would find it impossible to imagine. So Voltaire moves on to a conversation that she had with her brother, and she says, I cannot bear it any longer. I want to die. And her brother says, Has God Almighty in heaven agreed to be your next husband? So Voltaire really gives Louis a lot of credit for improving France. He says that Louis did more for France than 20 of his predecessors put together. Louis didn't really like living in Paris, and so he liked to live in the Palace of Versailles, and he spent a lot of money on that. And Voltaire faults him for spending so much money there when he could have spent it to beautify Paris, and he could have finished the Louvre. So later in his life, Louis grew tired of war. He was left with a massive debt, and there's one chapter devoted to finances, and the principal player here is the minister Colbert. Then, move, then Voltaire moves on to a chapter on the advances in science and arts, and this is one of the best chapters. 
you know, Louis really was a pivoting point between the old Gothic France and the new France, which had his imprint on it. And it's the one that we know well today. Voltaire says that the manners of court improved and, and that rippled out to the French countryside. I was thinking about Voltaire's own career in the arts and theater and philosophy. Um, and he owed a lot to Louis XIV. I mean, Louis XIV elevated culture to a high level and they supported the, he supported culture. So then Voltaire moves on to the ecclesiastical affairs and this is one of my least favorite subjects, but I was glad that I read it because Voltaire is pretty clear on what was going on between the Protestants and the Catholics, the Calvinists and the Jansists and the quietism. You know, he goes through all these things and he does a pretty good job. And I'm, you know, it's not my favorite subject, but I was grateful to have picked up all this. So in the end, I felt a great accomplishment after reading this book. Voltaire has a great enthusiasm for the subject, and that flowed over to me. And I really, you know, I got an overall feel for the age of Louis XIV, and I really look forward to go to France again. And, you know, when I go to the Louvre and go to Versailles and see all the monuments in France and Paris, uh, they're going to mean much more to me because I've read this book. And I really do like Voltaire's writing. He has very good observations. He makes it entertaining. Like, so I think this is a great book. Thanks for watching.